And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, a self-proclaimed author, madman, and threshold of the odd, Crid creator of long time um long time writer of novels and now making his venture into ta into tabletop gaming with incursion a conundrum role playing game the one and only JM Guyen how you doing today man doing great doing great how are you man i'm doing good i'm just counting the days until the colder weather starts coming in i hear you man me too it has been so hot here in missouri I mean, I know some. I know some will laugh about about a northerner complaining about heat, but I just came off of a heat wave where it felt like a hundred and seven. So. Mm, yeah. Yeah. No. No, I hear you. It was a rough week last week. And I'm sick of people saying, "But it's a dry heat," because <laughs> the way I look at it, is it worse to get? Is it worse to get hit in the? Is it worse to get um, punched below the belt or kick below the belt? <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. Good call. The answer is trick question. You're still you're still going to be on the ground in pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Either way, either way, you're screwed, my friend. Mm -hmm. Either way. Yep. But. I usually start these off with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. So, I ran, and geeky though this is, and I know it, but I ran the first live-action role-playing game in Southwest Missouri. Um, I became acquainted with a large live-action role-playing game up in the Northeast, and came back home and started my own rule set and that was in the mid 90s and since then all i've done is tell stories for a living um my i i broke out into ebooks later um probably i'd say early 2000s i mean they'd only been the kindle had only been out for a year or so when i started and uh from there i Wrote worlds upon worlds upon worlds, and now I'm getting back to my gaming roots, and I'm releasing a tabletop RPG. Mm -hmm. So, I will ad I will admit with what with what I saw with incur with incursion, uh, I get a very strong Men in Black vi Men in Black vibe with it. Mm -hmm. um, was that one of the inspirations, or is that coincidental? So the the series the setting was written before the Men in Black movies came out. Um, it actually initiated with uh, what some people call a killer game. Sometimes you hear it called Assassin. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in those kinds of games, you receive your target, and it's a stranger, probably, probably someone you don't know. Um, you get a picture, and you get their schedule. This would never work today, by the way. And then you hunt them down. You know, you use nerf weapons or squirt guns or you set traps in their dorm room or, or whatever. And we were doing that in the early 2000s. And it, it spouted and eventually turned into this kind of situation. Uh, when the study was first invented, um, it really was for all brands of weird um and you can see you can see that still in the stories, uh, ghosts or actual aliens or things like that. But pretty quickly, the series builds off into the eldritch and the uncanny and things that live beyond and outside our reality. Mm -hmm. And I had only written the first two books when people started asking me, "When are you going to make a game?" Or they started uh, modulating the rules of, say, Savage Worlds or things like that so that they could make their own. And uh, so the writing was on the wall that I was going to do it sooner or later. I just needed to 
settle in and figure out when, where, and how. And this last year, um, we, we had some design help. Me and my wife, we sat down. Our daughter did a lot of the art, and uh, we just cranked it out, and we have incursion. Mm -hmm. So, given the, would it be fair of me to say that you were that you were not not exactly a one system lifer that you had jumped around between different game systems over the years? It would be if I could do it differently. I, I really appreciate the uh, the design individual who helped us with um, with our system, who for odd reasons will not be named, but. Uh, if I could have, do it again, it's possible that I should have <clears throat> adapted Savage Worlds or something like that. I didn't understand how many system lifers would glom onto my project just because it happened to be in a world that they love, right? Um, so it's possible that um, by doing our own proprietary that... Um, you know, we're not going to reach a certain segment of the population. Um, but, you know, before that, yeah, I, I was, I was playing D and D in second edition and did all the old, oh, GURPS and Robotech and, um, gosh, we played Buffy the Vampire Slayer for a while. I mean, it was on the off season because believe it or not, even in Missouri, you can't LARP in the winter very well. Um, on the LARP season, we basically became a club of gamers, and we would get together and do tabletops. Um, and so, yeah, we we did every series, every um, every system that we could come up with. Mm -hmm. Well, I've never, I've, I've always rejected. For what it's worth, I've always rejected the idea that that um one can't do a proprietary system. That it has to be an adaptation of an ex of an existing one. Um, mostly, mostly because I re I remember the days where, um, especially especially in the early two thousands, where ev where everybody was everybody was trying to force um, their stuff to work within the D twenty system, even if it didn't, and a lot of times it really didn't. Um, right. The there are three big examples that always come to mind that have been punching bags ever since for how they for how they had no business using that system. Um, Fading Suns D twenty, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Deadlands D twenty, and yeah. Legend of the Five Rings Second Edition, which is mm. the latter most is in the halls of we don't talk about that with L five R fans. Because yeah, for sure, for sure. They tried to do both the roll and keep system that they used originally. And the D twenty system in the same books. Two system books are extremely rare. Yeah, agreed. And um, there's a reason for that. there's good reason for that. I'd say. <clears throat> yeah, I can agree with you there. I mean, I've seen it happen. A, I've seen it happen a handful of times, but I'd hesitate to say it's a common thing. Yeah, I can agree. I can agree. Um, they, uh, a lot of times people try to make things too complex, I think. Yeah. There w that was that was an epidemic in the 90s. <laughs> Every, everybody trying to go as simulation-y as possible and needing to have a skill for everything. Um, a lot of people would think Palladium is my whipping boy for that. And don't get me wrong, I I will roast Palladium for various things, but um, there's bigger fish. Um, oh, for sure, for sure. Um, one of the big examples is every game from Fantasy Games Unlimited. You know, I never really did a lot from Fantasy Games Unlimited because I had people telling me that I wouldn't like it and that I should stay away. There was also... The Believe, believe me when I say that they were right, but there was also the fir the first attempt at doing aliens in TTRPG form, the Aliens Adventure game. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
which is a modified version of Phoenix Command, and Phoenix Command is high up on my list of I will not run this again unless I'm being paid. Not as some sort of paid GM thing, but hazard pay. Because it's... It, w it was... Cr it was cr I'm, not a I'm not averse to crunch, but crunch is a pendulum. If you swing too far one way, you get the ridiculously overcomplicated mat materials. Um, Phoenix Command being one of them. You swing too far the other way, you get you get stuff like fate, which I have it I have some issues with, especially when it comes to guidance, or or you get a diceless game that's bi that barely counts as a game. You can swing again. You can swing too far one way, or you can swing too far the other way. But I had now given given that we given that discussion about the pendulum of complexity, um, I've often talked on this channel about about the Rome effect in role playing games of a certain mechanic that is the cent that is the central um, cent central bit of math for it, for a given game. You know, because, you know, all roads lead to Rome and all that. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, in, so, in some cases it's a roll high D20. In some cases it's a aim low D100, like in basic role playing. You have the rule of four, two die setup in Savage Worlds. You, ha you have, the, you have um, the pounds and pounds of dice in games like Shadowrun or World of Darkness when they're success-based um, die pools. So what what would be the central mechanic that is the Rome in Incursion? So our central mechanic is similar to uh, World of Darkness, but it also has some shadow run to it. Um, but part of what you've got to grapple with to understand why the central mechanic is the way it is, is that our assets, our primary heroes, are facing off against eldritch horrors that melt reality. And so when we were designing this game, we had to design a game that fit with the books. And in the books, sometimes people do things like turn the bones of targets into glass or transform the air that is already in your lungs into desflurene gas. It's, it's a power gamer's dream and a game master's nightmare. Because if you're going to stand against things that can alter reality with will, you've got to be able to do it too. So the base mechanic is that you have, you know, some attributes, you've got some combat skills and some personal skills. You utilize these to create your initial die pool. <laughs> and from there, based upon what packets you currently have active, which is a whole other kettle of fish you have tokens that allow you to add or subtract dice to your dice pool mm -hmm. um it's designed to be fast um i've always been inspired by how quick uh savage worlds is and and that's kind of the feel that i wanted i wanted to allow people the possibility to completely destroy physics and then for that to resolve down to a dice pool and a roll and you've got to have it because I'll tell you, on on the end of the creatures, they're going to be destroying physics, right? So you've you've got to be on top of it. So yeah, our basic, the easiest way to describe it is it is a dice pool game. Um, it is a five or six are our successes, and from there the game is figuring out how to stack as many dice into your dice pool as possible. So we're so we're dealing with a dice goblin affair of having tons of dice. You can have quite a bit of dice. Um, now, get, give, but, given that, given that, um, you mentioned you mentioned wanting you mentioned wanting to do that, but also being inspired by the simplicity in in um, Savage Worlds, which, as I mentioned before, has kind of a rule of four with its raise system. Um, I'm cu I'm curious what I'm curious what in savage worlds you brought you brought in to um or you was or served as inspiration for the mechanics in 
um, incursion. The thing that inspired us most regarding Savage Worlds is the speed of it. So it should come to play if if you've got people who know their system, and of course it takes a little bit to get to know a system, but it should come to play that by the time I turn to you and I say, Midri, it's your turn, what are you doing? Um, then you you know what your dice pool is before you even, even get to you. Um, and you drop your dice and on you go, right? Um, it shouldn't be a circumstance where by the time you get to the appropriate player, they're going, well, I've got this stat and I've got this thing and I've got all these tokens and I'm going to utilize my artisan packet in order to uh, transform the way gravity works within this field. And so I get this other dice. No, by the time it gets to the player, they should be able to just tell the game master, here's what I'm doing. Here's my dice pool. And they roll. Now, of course, of course, you could have game masters who are specifically wanting to see how you come to that dice total because, of course, there are people who will try and, you know, finagle you sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's it's pretty easy. Um, the game master knows what you have available, so if it comes down to it, um, they should be able to countermand you if suddenly you think that you have 15 dice that you're rolling or something ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. So, given, given that... Because Savage Worlds' tagline has always been fast, furious, fun. Correct. Uh, and since you're since you're going with a success based approach, um, would it be would it be fair, even if you are using tokens, um, would it be fair of me to say to say that the use of tokens to give yourself a larger die pool is going to be encouraged, because there is the tendency with with limited resources to fall into what I call the rainy day paradox. Mm. Mm. Also known as the 99 Mega Elixirs paradox. No, you won't have that circumstance. Um, tokens come um, fairly regularly. Um, it depends upon the packet that you're utilizing. So, in this world, the way that the, the story that gives rise to the rule system is that you have your regular life. You do whatever you do. You have your school. You have your job, whatever it is. And you'll be going about that life until they activate you. And when you're active, now you recall, my job is to go fight the monsters. So you will be directed to a location where they will equip you with your, your gear. You have a cybernetic crown in your head that has room for different packets. So you could be equipped with a packet that allows you to um, move superhumanly fast and know how to fight with katanas or a packet that allows you to feel eldritch emanation through your own nervous system, or allow you to alter the nature of thermodynamics, or change gravity, or uh, all these things. And when you're looking at your packet on your, your character sheet, it will tell you, you know, like per day or per combat, you have this many tokens that you can apply towards this or that circumstance. So there's not a circumstance where you would hold your tokens you know um you have you have more than enough it's 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 very much designed to challenge the game master to make certain that they're providing you with a challenge that's significant enough mm -hmm. because when you have assets that can shape reality at their will um you know there's a little bit of um of and i didn't know this at the time because uh, white wolf was a system i hadn't played a lot of uh, but when I did, I played Werewolf. Um, well, I didn't play Mage. And at the time, I guess that was Mage... Uh, was it the Ascension first? Yes. Okay. AKA, AKA the game that... The game that... Um, that, bent, that bends reality over. Right. Yeah, so we have to have that kind of feel where... When you are an asset that has the capability to, say, alter space-time or um, change the rate at which um, 
certain chemicals and things that you put into another asset's body heal them or uh, alter the way light flows around you so that you appear invisible. You know, when when you have that capability, um, you're really only limited by what you can imagine and what dice you have. Um, and and furthermore, there are there are stunt dice techniques that allow you to to really ramp up whatever you have going um, to allow you that that one one sweet shot where you're you know putting the grenade down Cthulhu's mouth or whatever it is that you need to be getting done right. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's how that works. Now, given what you've described with the with the crown system. Oh, there's a couple questions that that that, that brings up, and these are going to tie a bit into character creation. Hmm. Because of that, it's reasonable to assume that there's very little in the way of a, of a limit in terms of what in terms of what um, kit you could end up getting from your from your crown. So, hmm. how do you ins- how do you ensure that character creation is able to carry that variety without creating analysis paralysis too much obviously every game is going to have it but Mm. you can't but some games are going to have it more than others so there's a couple of different ways that you can do that depending upon how your your game master which is the designate you know it kind of sounds like a a spy master handle right um that the designate is running for you um what will happen is when you first come online in the books you your memories just trickle to you. They come slowly. You slowly awaken to what you're doing. And and as they're coming to you, and as you're remembering, you think, you know, it's been a while since I went for a walk down 3rd Street. And it's just a nudge, just a, a hint. And so you go on a walk down 3rd Street, and there's a door there you've never seen before. Well, inside is your personal white room. And your white room is loaded with whatever crazy technology that the designates wanted to leave for you did they leave you a gun that does not have bullets but instead fires kinetic bursts or a crossbow that shoots quarrels that creates um interdimensional portals where it lands or uh, grenades that whenever they go off uh, reduce physics back to its baseline and therefore thwart the evil cultists whatever the designate put in there that's just your equipment and in the game there's drones you can have and strange cars you can have and all kinds of spy equipment you know Mm -hmm. but what we're talking about with the crown is your packets now you have slots for packets in your crowns that you can load up and the designate in the book sometimes is like here's the three you can choose from and then sometimes it's wide open right um it's even possible for you to go through the first part of a mission say you're sneaking into a building in downtown laos and you uh you, it's all stealth right so you're you're like a ninja you have a katana and you you have something that lets light not interface with you appropriately and you're slipping in and, and then midway through oh my gosh they've summoned terrible crustacean horrors right here into this building and now you have to go to a white room to put on the titan or one of the other packets that is much more combative the serif right Mm -hmm. um so you can and as far as i know there's not a lot of games i haven't encountered that allow you to do this you can effectively change character class mid-play if your designate will give you a white room to do so um, you can change your capabilities as many times as the designate will allow you if you can get to a known localized white room. Mm-hmm. And with the, with that in, with that in mind, um, would it be fair of me to say that character creation and char- and character advancement is free form? It's pretty, um, it's, it's a point build. Um, I'll tell you one thing that some people find to be a weakness with character creation, the way that it's going to work, um, is that most of the game is taking place while you are active. Um, so there's this entire life you have 
you know, while you're working as a sales rep or an insurance guy or whatever it happens to be, and and those are your stats. Well, so for example, the artisan packet is a packet that allows you to shape laws of physics within certain parameters. It's almost like the wizard of the packets, right? Um, and that requires a high intellect. You have to be a smart person. You have to know equations to do it. Um, so one limitation there, while there is some free form to it, um, some of the packets might be a little more physical and require physical stats, and some of them might be a little more intellectual and require intellectual stats. So, it, you know, it just depends. It depends upon what you're trying to build. It, it, this game really does reward you for being a little more balanced. Mm -hmm. If you decide to spend all of your points on brawn, there will be some packets that just don't work as well for you. Yeah. And given that given that it is point based this is this is what this is where this is where the whole analysis paralysis debate um can really come into play because well let's look at say shadowrun up until okay. the priority system was introduced which was in um 4th edition um mm. Shadowrun, Shadowrun had a full-on point-based system. You pick, you pick your meta type, then you have a certain number of of car of karma points to spend on your attributes, your skills, advantages and disadvantages, and so on. Which certainly allows for a degree of flexibility, but there's also the issue of how of how do I do how do I do what how do I make the um sandbox build the character that's in my head that's in my head cuz there's not a right. whole lot of gui not a whole lot of guidance in those situations it's just here's here's some here's some points to start out with now swim damn it oh for sure for sure <clears throat> and so in our book and you know I think all books will do this if they're properly taking care of their players uh, we do provide several examples of archetypes um, that kind of allow a person to dip their toe in and figure it out. So you could decide that, you know what, on my first game, just to play around, I want to test out a drone engineer because I like the idea of having swarms and having... Um, you know, dash hound sized hornets that can uh, shoot quarrels that alter the nature of reality be on my side, right? Um, so my, originally I wasn't going to allow um, the point build of it because I didn't want exactly what you were talking about. But my designer talked to me and pointed out that most gamers prefer to use their own imaginations to build their own things. So after some back and forth, we did both. Uh, within the book, we included several different archetypal examples of assets so that you could just go, I want to see what it's like to be a combat monkey. I want to see what it's like to be a support class. I want to be one of the, I want to be a driver. I want to be someone who can uh, detect um, eldritch energies through my own nervous system and be able to uh, basically predict, prophesize what's coming and what we're going to hit in the next few minutes and uh, and go on from there. So that's my, my thought. If I were playing the game, I would choose an archetype first, uh, like in the example module that we give in the back, mm -hmm. just to kind of get my feet wet. And then if I wanted something more specific, I would dig in and do it from there. Yeah, I can get that. Now, whenever you have ga whenever you have games where you have people who are good at martial things and people who are good at uh, magical things, a lot of times the magical person ends up out ends up outclassing the the martial. This is known as linear warriors, quadratic wizards. Mm, um, yeah, I've heard that. In those kind of situations, it's easy for the for the martial character to not have as much of an appeal because they're not able to do all the reality bending stuff or the or have a level of contribution that is a bit more limited um how do you address that kind of thing in your sit in your system to make it so that the martial characters are just as viable and just as interesting as 
the more supernaturally inclined um, characters. I'll tell you, we actually almost had the opposite problem, thanks to one of my playtesters, who uh, who made just just a monstrous, monstrous combat monkey. Uh, to be fair, um, this person is one of the more intelligent people that I think played my game, but my goodness, in the early stages, he was pointing out that, yeah, it's possible for someone to melt the flesh off another person or steal their mind or do things along those lines. But, you know, if you build your combat monkey just right, due to stealth and speed, why, you might have six mo- six moves before they have one. Hmm. Now, we pared that back a little bit, um, but not a lot, because they're meant to be the hyper fast ninja characters right those are meant to exist um it's also possible to um say be a gun monkey who has null materia rounds or um which is basically weapons that will collapse a certain area of space into a fold between worlds um so it's it's quite possible to have your equipment be so reality bending that even if you are a gun monkey or even if you are a sword ninja or whatever you want to be um you might be having so many moves or your equipment might be able to banish monsters just by you know being struck by them uh to the point that you're you're quite impressive so i actually had to tone it back a little bit um and i suspect i suspect that among your listeners and among the people who are being so good as to support the Kickstarter, um, there are people who are definitely clever enough to figure out that kind of thing, yeah. you know. Um, but the way that we we approached it, and this is actually kind of a point of pride, the the designate the game master, they're using eldritch horrors up to and including the level of a Cthulhu style world ending creature. So in this game, if you're a player and you do figure out some arcane combination of tokens and dice and packets that gives you 15 moves for every one move the cultist gets, we decided we should let you do it. Right. Yeah, that I can certainly get. Um, And A lot of people in my audience are, much like myself, have spent years toiling under under this idea of that um that unfortunately because of er early editions of the world's most ubiquitous role playing game, people still have this mindset, as annoying as it is, of of the martial character is is not supposed is not supposed to be powerful. They're just supposed to sit sit there and and. And, ta- and tank and just do basic attack all day which mm. if you if your if your exposure to fantasy is is in is in novels that aren't going that aren't going to spend a whole lot of time with fight scenes I can understand that but um, some of my students they're they are big fans of are big fans of say um, kung, of say kung fu movies hmm, for sure or 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 samurai films or or various manga and they're not going to be able to they're not going to be able to connect as well to converting somebody who has all these different techniques and is masters of all these different um fighting styles to just basic attack oh for sure no no that's that's absolutely true um so what we try and do uh depending upon the packet in which you are are utilizing um we have the adept which comes with uh, pre-programmed combat moves you know um and a lot of times we find that what our people are doing is combining them with other gear and equipment to move differently for example um there's a difference between having the adept and um using a stick you found having an adept and using your katana and having an adept and using the shogun class katana which is specifically geared with nanotechnology in order to allow you to move more quickly and more significantly um it's it's not so much a position where um i the game gets to tell you 
well, now you're doing, you know, your crane style. This is your tiger strike. This is your your chi strike. This is this, this is that. It's much more um, you stacking your dice and stacking your tokens. And then you tell me what you just did. Right, you 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 tell me the story of how that worked because, you know, the the successes is all in the dice, right? Mm. So in that way, it's similar to some of what White Wolf did. So if you want to claim that your adept packet um, makes you the equivalent of this kind of grandmaster or that kind of grandmaster, and you know that stuff, please do it. Some of our best conventions that we had selling these books were anime conventions, and we've been described as a novel form of what many people, you know, go to anime for, right? Um, so, you know, so yeah, absolutely, I see that, and we want people to do that. We want folks to uh, find the way to make themselves more cool. Yeah, that's the point. And if it's if it sounds like I'm clowning on the on the OSR mind, mindset, I'm that's that's not my intent. My intent is to clown on the the idea the the idea of fa of fantasy being this one being this some um, one way affair. Right. Um, right. And just to, just to just as a case in point, when it comes to when it comes to that kind of thing. The most common way to equip a fighter in the world's most ubiquitous role-playing game is sword and board. But if sure. I'm running, if I'm running a campaign that's set in, say, a um, a fa a fantasy India, for instance, that particular equipment method doesn't have the same level of cultural footprint. Right. The the weapon with the biggest cultural footprint in, say, in say. A lot, a lot of parts of India, because well, India is a large country, and you're gonna, have, and that's where things get complicated. But the big one is the bow, with the spear taking a se taking second place. Right. And of course, and of course, we let's go even further east into something like say Japan, where shields aren't really a thing. Right. Right. I know some people bring up bring up the shields that were used to block arrows, though that's that's just that's just that's just planted cover. That doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, agreed. No, when I when I say shield, I'm th I'm thinking of something that you're either holding in your hand or you're slinging onto your you're slinging onto your arm for the purposes of blocking. Um, and of course this of course even even more so. Um, if if say you wanted to run a more gladiator style game, which I've which I've done, where I had I had one, I had one in the in the past where instead of people running one character, they were all running a gladiator stable. So oh, they, nice! So they had multiple characters they had to, they had to keep an eye on. Um, of course, I did I didn't tell them that since we we're doing a gladiator game, um, if there's no there's no raised dead that's going to be involved. <laughs> right, right. Like the way you the way you level up is not is not by taking out enemies. It's by not dying. <laughs> right. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Oh, uh, but you look at the way gladiators were were equipped, and in in even even if I was to use say AD AD and D for instance, the way armor works in the, in those kind of games. You'd end up with characters that are ridiculously squishy. For sure, yes. But they're supposed to be these hardened gladiators that are able to hold their are able to hold their own even with the unbalanced equipment. Mm -hmm. So it's it's one of it's one of those things where the I know some people say that fi that the rules and the set and the setting don't have to can, don't have can be divorced from each other. I don't I don't I don't vibe with that. Right. Because ideally, one ha one should feed into the other. Agreed. Um, I suppose a, I suppose a case in point would be why is it that you why is it that you have to that you have to make the have to run the risk of the peril ro rolls when you're a, if you're a wizard in say Warhammer Fantasy? Well, it's because ma it's because magic is this dangerous thing that if you mess around with it too too much, you're gonna find out. Yeah. Yep. 
and you and thus you have the perils of the warp ta you have the per you have the perils of chaos tables and the, and the like um to re to reinforce that fact now given th given that um is it a is it a case where there's not a whole lot of dis there's not a whole lot of description of the rules of gi of given abilities it, it's going to rely a bit more on description or is that not exactly the case so well you know let me i want to give you an example so i'd like to pull this up if i can let's see if my wife has finished with it, and then I can pull it up for you. So when you say abilities in that context, um, remember that most of our capabilities in this game are equipment-based or packet-based, mm -hmm. right? So for the most part, what we're doing... Yeah, she's in that document. I'm not pulling it up. Um, <clears throat> so for the most part, what we're doing is we're finding out what a set of equipment or packet, how much that will alter your percentage chance to pull a thing off. And then you're talking to me about the thing that you're trying to pull off. It's cooperative. It's storytelling. Um, it's intended to be something that uh, gets you much, much more into the game than I hit and I did seven points of damage. Right. And given that, um, out of curiosity, do you have some sort of st some sort of equivalent to a stunt bonus, um, something that rewards descript descriptive play? Yes, we do. Um, we have stunt dice, um, and the stunt dice are specifically put there. Uh, depending upon your game, I believe that the what we came out to in the end was that your base was three stunt dice per game that you could add when you were trying to pull off something particularly, particularly insane. And then the designate is re-rewarding you with stunt dice whenever you, you know, describe something appropriately, role play well, you, you know, the, the binnies kind of thing, right? Um, and that's, that's how they're, they're rewarded for doing that because we, even though I started with gaming years ago, so much of my career has been storytelling and it's very important to us that we are not only able to carry over as much of the storytelling vibe as possible, um, but that we reward players who do the same. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Now, given the nature of the of the, of the whole activated agent kind of thing, since that does mean there's a wide variety of potential missions, do you have plans on putting in? S some sort of guideline for GMs to cre to create missions or ev or even a mission generator. So I do want to uh, do a mission. Um, okay, so there's a couple of answers to that. First is that in the book it does talk about the ways to create missions, and even though this isn't a full-on bestiary, there's a uh, I think 15 pages of creatures that people who are familiar with our books um, will recognize instantly and kind of get a little bit of a, a chuckle over, right? Um, there is a mission that comes with the game, and everyone who supports is going to uh, be tapped into something called the Facility Archives, where every month I'm going to drop extra content, extra monsters that didn't appear in the game, extra dungeons, locations, NPCs that some people may be familiar with. Um, and what I would like to do, just depending upon the success levels of the game, is I would like to have a uh, kind of a monthly group where we're talking on Discord or something like it, and we're trying to... Uh, to work out some of these things to help people really, really get their teeth into it. Because for so long, people have been asking me for a game that runs along the ideas of, of this setting. Because it is such a game-like setting. You have your normal life, and then, well, what packet do you want to play this time, right? Mm -hmm. um, right, and so it just it really meshes in well. So 
that's my hope. Uh, my hope is that we have enough support and enough success with it that uh, we can build a community around it because it's much more about the community and listening to people and listening to feedback and making the proper changes uh, than it is just putting on a huge Kickstarter and making some cash, right? Yeah, and I, I can certainly get to that. Now, given the nature of that whole activated and deactivated a agent approach, um, it would be it would be easy for that to be read into this game. This game it leans towards one shots. Could incur could incursion handle a mo a um, longer um, campaign story, or is it or is there going to be a leaning towards one shot style? So not only does it lean towards campaigns, um, but I mean remember the the setting is a six book series and the six book series is they're bible thick you know i mean they're they're pretty significant and it's the ongoing adventures of right it's just that it begins with activation mm -hmm. which def definitely makes sense the th the thing that, the thing that was in the back of my mind is whether or not this was built around um, tr around treating campaign sessions as individual episodes or ch or chapters, or if or if we're de if the possibility of something of greater length could ha could happen. So you know, I would I would think that campaigns would be done into, um, you know, I mean, we could run an adventure that is going to take us five or six sessions to defeat, but that is one dossier, right? That that. Ensures where the bad guys realized who the asset was and came and took him. And I got to tell you, it's kind of interesting watching normal people have to deal with the horrific monsters from beyond while the facility is frantically trying to bring them online, right? So there's, there's all kinds of ways that it can be done. Um, and one of my hopes is to showcase the potential of continuing adventures by making uh, public adventures written for this game that are parts of the books that you know like things that happened in between or um things that happened with side characters or things along those lines so that it can continue that story mm -hmm. now on the kickstarter page it does say that only players use di use dice so is this a case where the only thing that the gm is going to be deciding is the is the is the diff is the um, difficulty thresholds and in the case of en in the case of enemies attacking is it more of your ro they're both rolling to attack and they're rolling to not get hit and they're rolling to not get hit correct they're rolling to attack and then they roll to defend mm -hmm. um, and that, and that allows the player to decide how they're going to defend because some of these packets have things like a hard light shield or <clears throat> the ability to become insubstantial you know and so if uh if i'm just rolling to hit you i'm not allowing you your player agency in choosing how things go down which is again the way the whole game is written if i'm going to hit you with cthulhu level monsters i want to give you every opportunity to attempt to save yourself in fact and this is a little bit of a divergence but not not much one of my favorite mechanics in the game is your final move so if i have you the cultists are holding you down you've used all your gear you're hurt you know you're going to die you get a last act you can play an extra turn and the rules to the extra turn are you're gonna die you can't stop the death no matter what you do. But this is the moment when you shove the grenade in the monster's mouth or you reach into your pocket and you throw the microchip to your friend or you know you do that last heroic thing that saves everybody. Uh, we really try at every circumstance to make it rest upon the player's choice, the player's agency, and their roles. Mm-hmm. So with that with that in mind, um, 
what what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count for the book? Um, it is well, I can actually tell you that. Hold on. So this is another thing that uh, we did differently than most Kickstarters do. Um, most Kickstarters will uh, may set up their page and they will set out to create a product. They're telling you, here's what we're going to do, here's how we're going to do it, give us the money and we will. Mm -hmm. The book is done. We've already made it. We've we've kickstarted to attempt to recover our costs from the year it took us to do it. But it's not as if anyone funding this is going to have to sit and wait for us to maybe possibly try and finish it. Um, I'm looking at the spiral bound all color copy right now. And this is 175 pages. Mm -hmm. And... With and what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the digital version at the at the very least? So there's no reason why when someone selects the digital version, which is I believe twenty five dollars on my page, um, I mean we have those files. They're they're finished. Um, someone who who supports at that level, um, as soon as the Kickstarter's over. Uh, I mean, they'll have their game within a few days. I mean, I would say a week at the very most, and that's if I'm not sitting down to crank out. A lot of it depends upon how how much work it's going to take um, the printer to get me the physical copies. You know, um, you know, I don't know right now if I'm going to be frantically trying to print, package, and ship you know, 300 spiral bounds and 150 hardbacks and all this other stuff. But, but conceivably, conceivably, um, I mean, I could, I could email people physical copies now. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing <clears throat> how it, how it develops because based on how you describe things, even though this isn't billed as a universalist game, there it, there, there really is no li no limit when when we're dealing with, um, the when with this sort of high t high tier reality, for lack of a better term, fuckery. Right, right. Um, and I will cert I, I will certainly keep an eye out on ho on how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness. It's wonderful here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I love being on the show. I love talking to you and... I can't wait to hear your take on Incursion. Mm -hmm. You strike me as one of those individuals who has been around the gaming block so many times that you're going to have something to say one way or the other, mm -hmm. and I I need input from people like you who know what they're doing when it comes to tabletop games, for sure. The tabletop scene needs input needs input from more people who um do do not do not um do not have a default system. I would say. Right. And yeah. No. That's something I try. That's something I try and do. But of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs> <laughs>